So what hope is there at the moment uh, for getting this vaccine, well, well, vaccinations underway in the first quarter of next year? Well, first of all, Rish, it's, it's worth noting that we have done an incredible thing. When I say we, I mean the world and the scientific community and the biopharmaceutical industry to go from identifying a brand new virus in January of this year to having a vaccine on the verge of being launched is an extraordinary scientific accomplishment. I would say that it's one of the biggest scientific accomplishments of this century to date. We have uh, done a big thing to get to this point, but people are appropriately pointing out that it's not going to deliver itself, that vaccine, to all the people that need it around the world. I have to say that the announcement by Operation Warp Speed leader, Monsef Slawi, was extraordinarily encouraging that the U.S. government is moving very quickly to evaluate the data from the first vaccines that have reported data and that they will be vaccinating as soon as mid-December. I think if if Monsef is saying that they will begin broader vaccination early next year, uh, this is a person who is, is very, very experienced in vaccine development, and I believe him. Now, I will say that, that when I first heard about these timelines, I thought they were very, well, uh, I'll say extraordinarily ambitious, and there were really three things that I thought could get in the way. One is the data itself. Uh, at the time that I first heard about these timelines, I wasn't, uh, nobody was aware whether any of these vaccines would work. And it now appears that at least two of them do. The second is the manufacturing challenges that come along with any vaccine. These are a bit unpredictable. Uh, although you can uh, plan for success, things can come and surprise you. Uh, if uh, Dr. Slawi is saying that this is uh, on track from a manufacturing standpoint, that gives me more confidence. And then, of course, the final is the distribution, which I think is what you're referring to, this very complex logistical cold chain, frozen cold chain effort that will have to be undertaken worldwide in order to get the vaccine to people. That's a big unknown. We haven't done that before, but I'm hopeful that the right planning is being put in place, not just in the U.S., Rajiv? but in the world that can expect to receive these vaccines. Yeah, Rajiv, I would visit that uh, in a minute or two, but I just want to get to the efficacy of the vaccine itself. Sure, it's been tested. It's got this 95% effective rate. The point is that Further down the line, you know, what about long-term implications of this? I mean, do you foresee any of that? People have talked about a DNA rejigging as a consequence of this, and that could be a nasty uh, side effect for this medication, as it were. What's your take? So from the standpoint of the RNA vaccines, which are really the genetic code for the protein that is seen in the virus, uh, there is essentially no risk that that would alter the DNA of a person receiving the vaccine. The safety assessment that is being done before these vaccines receive their first approvals is very, very significant. And I would say that it's close to the safety assessment, if not the same in many cases, as what we would see under normal vaccine development circumstances. In fact, the size of the clinical trials that are being conducted right now are about the same size as what you would normally expect. And that's really where you pick up uh, some of the very unusual side effects you might have from a vaccine. So I think that, you know, subject to reviewing the data by the experts and the regulatory authorities, if there is an approval and a recommendation, I think people can feel very good about the assessment of safety and efficacy. Rajiv, it's Juliet here in Sid, uh, Singapore. As we say, we're waiting on this approval to come through. But 50 million doses is your initial plan. At what point do we see the entire population of Japan able to get some kind of vaccine? Is that pushing further out until the end of 2021? Well, I, I hope not. The, the Japanese government has entered into agreements with a number of manufacturers. Takeda is one of those manufacturers, and we have partnered with Moderna, uh, one of the companies that's producing an mRNA vaccine, to distribute that in, uh, in Japan in the first half of next year. I don't know what the timelines are for the other partnerships the Japanese government has put in place, but I assume that they are similarly ambitious to have vaccine delivered as soon as possible uh, in 2021. You said this was an extraordinary accomplishment. You've worked on a number of other vaccines as well, including uh, dengue and Zika. Tell us just how, you know, more in terms of this process and how widespread, I guess, the healthcare system has been working on trying to ensure that we do get some kind of vaccine that is going to hopefully eradicate this pandemic. And do you see an end to this pandemic in the next couple of years? 
Well, so in terms of the, the effort that's been undertaken, we can compare it to how long it normally takes vaccines to be developed, which could be anywhere from eight to 15 years. In fact, the dengue vaccine that we've been developing at Takeda has been in development for over 20 years, and that's not uncommon in vaccines. So this is an incredible shortening of the timelines, but people should not assume that corners are being cut because, as I said earlier, the safety assessment is going to be quite robust. There will be some long-term, very rare side effects that uh, potentially might not be identified uh, during these large phase three clinical trials and would emerge later. But by definition, those are likely to be very, very unusual and are unlikely to, to change the, uh, the overall benefit risk assessment of, of, of the vaccine. In terms of, of the, the end of the pandemic, you know, there's light at the end of the horizon. When we started developing, when I say we, I mean uh, the scientific and uh, community and industry began this process, we didn't know whether it was even possible for a vaccine to prevent this infection, believe it or not. Some infections are very, very hard to prevent and illnesses. Uh, we've now proven that with these first two vaccines. And not just that, we've also shown that the target of those first two vaccines, which is called the spike protein of the virus, appears to be the right target. The fact that it worked for these two vaccines is a very, very good signal for many other vaccines in development. And what that means is that we're likely to see more positive data emerge in the coming weeks and months. What that means is that more companies are likely to bring vaccines to the world. And ultimately, that means more vaccine for the world and more uh, better chance at a fair distribution of vaccine for the world. And we really do need that in order to bring this pandemic to an end. You can't just have, for example, rich countries getting access to the vaccine if you want the pandemic to end. Aside from that being bad from an equity standpoint, it's bad from a public health standpoint. And the more companies that bring vaccines to the market, the better chance we have of the pandemic ending soon. On that front, can you tell us a little bit about the cost and I guess what kind of boost this could be to Takeda's business? Well, from our standpoint, we are working on these vaccines because this is an emergency. And we have had a pandemic influenza preparedness effort partnership with the Japanese government for a long time now. We view it as our responsibility to do whatever we can to address the pandemic. This is not the only thing we're doing, by the way. We have a, a, a very sizable plasma medicine operation, which uh, on an ongoing basis is treating lots of individuals around the world with, uh, with medicines derived from human plasma, from healthy individuals. And what we're doing with that plasma effort is we're turning it to individuals who have recovered from COVID-19 infections that have very high antibodies in their bloodstream. We're purifying those antibodies and pooling them across many people and using that as a medicine that we're testing as we speak to see if that can reduce the severity of the illness. When you think about antibody treatments. This is a form of antibody treatments. And we, we do hope that we'll be able to show that it's effective in the, in the coming weeks. Rajiv, we've got, of course, uh, big challenges for using either of these uh, ones which we mentioned, these vaccines uh, in uh, developing countries. Uh, that, that could also be a really big, uh, as you put it earlier, uh, health problem here. Uh, and the other thing is that even in some rich countries, primarily the United States, when you've got so many anti-vaxxers, this is something which has to be looked at closely, doesn't it? And this could uh, really mean that the, uh, the, the virus doesn't go away. Yeah. Let me take that, uh, that in, in two parts. First, on the delivery challenges, there's no question that, that delivery of vaccines to large populations so quickly is hard. But you know what's really hard? Developing a vaccine in under a year. That is extraordinary. And we, as a global community, have done something extraordinary. Uh, this, from a scientific standpoint, this is like a moonshot, a successful moonshot. Now, delivery is going to be very complicated, but you know, we don't have to invent planes and we don't have to invent freezers. We actually deliver commodities to the farthest reaches of the world every single day. And so it's really a matter of getting the best logisticians, the best infrastructure people, uh, the most experienced uh, individuals who, who know supply chains uh, to apply their talents to this problem. Of course, it also takes strong leadership and it takes financial resources. And if governments don't do what's necessary to lead and invest in these distribution mechanisms starting immediately if they haven't started already, then we are potentially going to run into distribution problems. And that's something that everyone needs to be focused on right now, now that we know that vaccines are coming. With regard to vaccine hesitancy, this is a 
concern that has come out of some polls that people have done. Uh, people uh, have a range of concerns about these vaccines, primarily because they're developing so fast, uh, being developed so fast. Some people have political concerns. Some mm. people have, you know, historical concerns about vaccines in general. I believe that as more data is collected over time, people will see that these vaccines uh, they, there'll be transparency and they'll see the safety profile and the efficacy profile of these vaccines. Let's fast forward, if you will, a few months from now. There will be some people that have received vaccines and some that have not yet received vaccines. We'll still be seeing COVID cases, but in all likelihood, the majority, nearly all of those COVID cases and severe illnesses and deaths will happen in people that have not received vaccines. We won't be seeing the same proportions in people that have been vaccinated. And over time, yeah. if we gather more information, I think people will gain more confidence in these vaccines. And I think over the long term, the vaccine hesitancy issue will be taken care of. Rajiv, there's been a lot of criticism about how the Trump administration has handled the coronavirus. You used to work for the Bush administration. There's now an incoming Biden administration. Your thoughts on how the Trump administration has handled it quickly and any chance for you to return to the White House? Well, look, I, I, I'm not going to talk about the administration uh, specifically, although what I say is going to be hard to decouple from the administration. We have had a huge problem with the response to this pandemic in the U.S. Uh, it be In the beginning, it was due to issues with testing, but later on, it has become a much bigger problem. We now are fighting two battles in the U.S. One battle is against the virus. The other is against a large proportion of the population that question what, questions whether COVID is a real problem and questions the basic public health measures like wearing masks universally as an effective measure to protect people against COVID. And frankly, that is a tougher one to tackle. That issue of science denialism is really getting in the way of an effective response. And what we really need in the U.S. right now is leaders across the country, including governors of states, to step up and get behind science, get behind what we know works, uh, to, to turn this, this thing around. Now, in terms of the, the Biden administration, they've assembled a group of experts, many of whom I know and have worked with. I have a lot of confidence in that group, and I really am looking forward to that group issuing and starting to share its thoughts so that uh, governors and others can begin to take action in line with what we can expect from that body in the future. And by the way, in terms of my own uh, return Raji to government, Bank. that's not something that I'm, I'm, I'm currently um, planning to. I'm, I'm very happy to see that there, there are very experienced uh, people moving into these positions as we speak.